So Martin uh, was for many years an IT, uh, in the IT business, but his real passion has been history. And through retirement, he's been uh, researching all kinds of local history and is a voluntary researcher at the Surrey History Centre in Woking uh, and a real expert on the uh, local history of the, Great, uh, of the First World War. Um, you may remember um, Martin's talk back in February 2020, right on the eve of the pandemic. Um, uh, that talk was on the industrialization of Kew and Richmond during the First World War. Uh, he then subsequently wrote up the uh, uh, talk for uh, an article in one of our publications, actually. Martin, can you grab that? Sorry, I meant to bring it up. Uh, in, in the, yeah, so uh, in this publication, which is the annual uh, Richmond History uh, Journal that uh, Robert edits, um, and Martin wrote an article on that talk for this, and this actually won the first of two uh, awards for the best local history journal uh, in London. Um, he also separately won award for the article in its own right for, uh, from the British Association for Local History, so really, really terrific. Uh, so we're delighted to have him tonight. Uh, his talk tonight is on a, a, a different topic, although the same kind of era, the sort of uh, early period of the 1900s. Um, um, we're very blessed, of course, in this area, uh, in Richmond, Kew, Petersham and, and Ham, for our local historical uh, landmarks, landmark, landmark buildings, our royal palaces, our um, Palladian mansions, our Georgian townhouses. Now, Martin's going to talk on a very different uh, end of the social spectrum, the, some, of, but some of the pioneering council housing developments that we have here in Richmond. Um, as Robert was mentioning just at the end of the AGM, uh, we're going to have um, uh, um, some drinks at the end, and I know Martin will stay around for, for, some, uh, for some further conversation. And we're at the end of this talk, which will probably last about 45 minutes, we'll have uh, some questions, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll moderate. Uh, but with, without further ado, uh, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a bit of background, as I said, I'm now a researcher, at the volunteer researcher, no money in it, is a volunteer researcher at the Surrey History Centre. I have an advantage. I was already living in Woking and the Surrey History Centre moved to 300 yards from where I live. So they moved to me. So they obviously saw something in me even then. Um, the, as you can probably gather from the accent, I'm local. I actually grew up in the Hounslow Witton borders, so I know this area very well. Um, I even remember age 14 or 15 on my bike on the Thames by the bridge. Is it the Castle Pub? Used to be there, the big pub. Listening to the Rolling Stones. And when a, when a chair came through the window, my mate and I decided we'd better cycle home. It was, <laughs> it was only about 14 or 15, so I'm a relatively local chap. Um, I do a number of papers and I project manage a number of things at the Surrey History Centre. One thing to listen and look out for that's just about to be launched, the Surrey History Centre are going to produce a World War II bomb map and it's gonna be interactive. And when it's Surrey, we mean old Surrey. So it includes Richmond, okay? We've had to include Spilthorne, despite the fact that's what I still call Middlesex, but there's politics in that. So, and the, there's actually a project meeting starting up on Thursday. So I'm gonna be project managing that or project managing the volunteers. So it's a couple of years work. It's not a quick job, but, uh, very interesting. Okay, so let's get on to what we're doing here. The, what I'm gonna talk about more than anything else, but don't get me wrong, we'll cover Richmond as well, is the London County Council and their pioneering work on council housing. Now, 
I, I've stopped doing it. I used to say, hands up anybody who grew up in a council house or whose parents did. And I found too many people were embarrassed to put their hands up because they didn't want the person next to them knowing. But I bet you a lot of you either grew up in a council house or your grandparents did or your aunts and uncles. I didn't, but the house I grew up in was built on the same road and at the same time as council houses. So it, it, I'm nearly a council house lab, not quite. Now, it's always a good idea to start a talk with a photo. It always gets things going. So what we got here is a lovely photo. I, can't, I haven't got time to talk about it in great deal, but there's a lot in this photo that matters. If you stood where the photographer is at the moment, what you'd see is Bankside Power Station dominating behind them, and that passageway, you'd look down, you see the Wobbly Bridge and St Paul's. So that's where we are, Southwark. Okay? And what you've got here is a group of people. These are the working classes. We don't want to get mixed up. Are they poor or are they not? It doesn't matter. As we'll see, the fact it, it, the poor wasn't a measure. What the measure was is the working classes, as we'll see. Now, if I get it right, look at the pe they, these, little, these people here. Look at him with his collar on. What there is in this is pride. The parents knew this photo was going to be taken, rushed the kids inside, dressed them up. They weren't having their kids in a photo looking scruffy. Didn't quite work with his shoes. <laughs> you can see the toes sticking through, but you can't have everything else. The other thing, quite important is, where are the men? Right, I can tell you where they are. One's there and one's there. As the police would say, looking furtive. Right? Now, this is quite important because what you've got is a bunch of ladies that are very proud and don't want their kids looking scruffy because it's going a photo. You'll see how important this is in the early days of social housing. The other thing to spot, if you haven't spotted already, is... It's not... Oh, hang on a minute. Big Mama. Right, there she is. You know who runs that. You know she's the one who said, yes, you can take this photo, get your kids sorted. So what we're talking about are these people. These people work six days a week. They're on the bread line, right? These are people who the government, London, the authorities needed to help. So, who is going to help them, right? You've got no social security, no pensions, right? No sick pay, no medical help, no work, sorry, no pay. Now, the, the, we're talking about 1800s, late 1800s. The problem is the government and the industrialists were worried about revolution. Just across the channel, too many revolutions. So they were worried both about their profits, always about money, and revolution. So they, maybe a bit reluctantly, wanted to help these people. Now, another term given to these people, which I don't actually quite like, is called the deserving poor. I would call them the deserving working classes. Right? But the deserving bit is quite important at this point. So, what happened in the early stages is the philanthropist stepped in. So the people, and you'll recognise some of them. Top of the list, still going, by far the biggest is Peabody. Peabody were one of the very, very first philanthropist housing companies. Still going, they went in a bit of money trouble recently, but they're still going strong. Headquarters in Westminster Bridge Road. Very, very good company indeed. Then you've got a chap called Sidney Waterlow. He stopped building because it started to become unprofitable for him. He's, the ex he's Waterlow Printers, well-known printing company, and he was at one point the Mayor of London. Whoops, sorry. Octavia Hill, 
the high priestess of housing. We'll talk about her in a moment. A chap called James Hartnell, you would have never heard of him, but I'm going to show you some of his housing because it's very much along the same line. Now, philanthropists, I've put the London County Council in there because their very early housing was philanthropic, as we'll see in a minute. Note the date, 1888. The County of London did not exist until 1888. The vast majority of what we, we came to call London was Middlesex. Below the Thames, it was Surrey, and there was a little bit of Essex over on the, the north, north east. But I'm going to come to them in a minute. Then you've got Guinness. Guinness buildings, they're still going. Where I live in Woking, there's a Guinness estate. Um, very late to the market, but again, he's there. And you never guess where the East End Dwelling Company built their buildings. No prizes, right. Now, Octavia Hill. There she is. You may also know of Octavia Hill from somewhere else. She was one of the three founders of the National Trust. So people go, oh, I know that name. She was one of the three founders. I would say that the best description of her is you don't mess with Octavia Hill. She's one of these Victorian ladies. She tells you to do Sunday, you do it. Right, what she did in the late 1800s, she purchased run-down buildings. So she actually bought some terrible places, right? And, but this is great. She employed lady managers, housing managers. Right? Do you remember that photo? What all the ladies are at home during the day. You've got a housing manager who's a lady. Suddenly it fits. They built up a relationship with the lady of the house, but rent had to be paid on time. This was absolute strict rule. Obviously, if the, the, the householder was ill or anything, there may have been a bit of leeway. But basically, you couldn't drink the rent. <laughs> you had to pay it. Good tenants got small improvements done to the building. Right? The best tenants got upgraded. Isn't this a good idea? No. Bad tenants, though, out. There are housing managers all over the country that would love to do those last three, <laughs> but can't, right? Because you kick them out, you've got to look after them somewhere else, right? But this is, this is 1800s, late 1800s. Right, now a lot of London, we're talking about London, so I want, it's a lovely map. You, we talk about London, and I wanted to show you that, it's not come out particularly clearly, this is North London, this is Clerkenwell. So there's Liverpool Street Station, the city of London is here. Right, that's an A to Z map of the north part, the north part of the city. Now, overlaid on it is Charles Booth's map. These are famous maps that are London School of Economics are the original maps. These are colour coded. So what he did, he walked around the whole of London, not the city, interestingly. No, the city isn't covered. Walked around London with a policeman in tow, very sensible, and he mapped the poverty. So you've got, for example, where there's red, look at yellow. There isn't any yellow here, by the way. Red, middle class, well-to-do. Here they are, up the roads, Finsbury Square, right? Then you gradually get poor and poor. To get to the black, lowest class, vicious, semi-criminal. Right? But have a look here, Finsbury Square. Look, black, black. There's red, well-to-do. Look. That, so the, don't get the idea that the East End was absolutely full of slums. It was, well, it wasn't covered in them. But that's the important bit. And what we're now talking about is actually redeveloping the slums to create what we now call the council housing. This block up here, which is in pink, we we'll talk about in a moment. Right, so the London County Council is going to come along. We'll have a look at some of the buildings in a minute. But in 1888, they got formed and they had brilliant architects and they were really wanted to do a great thing for, the, for London. 
Right, so the first thing is that it's five storeys maximum. To be honest with that, it couldn't build much higher than that anyway, but they said five storeys, so we don't want things rising higher and higher. Right, minimum room sizes, hello, hello, hello. Start to get the rules here. Minimum, and those room sizes, minimum, were generous. Self-contained, which means a WC, which means your own WC, your own toilet, in your, what we now call flats. These were called dwellings, not even apartments, right? Now, even Peabody was, had shared toilets at this time. So this was quite innovative. Cottages, we could now call them terraced housing, but they were called cottages. To have a garden, not a yard, a garden. Remember, garden estates, that's where it all comes from. And the rents, this was a problem, the rents had to be comparable. So you demolished slums, you built really nice housing for the workers, but your rents have got to be equivalent to what's going on around. Some of them made a loss, some of them made a profit. But the thing about the London County Council is it's that big. <laughs> so an unprofitable building over there was counteracted by a very profitable one there. Very useful. Not many councils could do it. Liverpool did it, Glasgow did it, nobody else did it. They just couldn't build enough. Open staircases and walkways, we'll see plenty of examples of those. And all those standards rose, got better and better. So the beginning of the standards, almost for the whole country, came from London County Council. The others followed, including Richmond, as we'll see. And it wasn't called council housing. It was just called housing. The term council housing, with a capital C, capital H, first appeared in the 1930s as a positive term in the newspapers. Right. Less of the rattle, let's have a look at some of the things of ill, because this, this becomes interesting then. Right, before London County Council, 1864, this is a long way back. They, 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 this is the second of these blocks ever built in London, it's called Cromwell Buildings, and it was built by Sidney Waterloo. And that's what he built. Now, if you've got this shadow, this is Southwark Street, and that is the railway line from London Bridge to Waterloo East, going that way. And Thames is over the back. Now, if you have a look at it, it doesn't look much, right? Except it's got open walkways, it's got a staircase. Look at the back of the building, a window for every room, including the toilet and the scullery. This is, in 1864, this is amazing. And this is for the working classes. Admittedly, maybe the more foreman type working class, because of the rent. So, whoa, this is 1864, we're already thinking. These, these are pretty nice. And of course, still standing, blue plaque. All right, that's blue plaque, that place. Now, we're moving on a bit. 18, what have we got? 1887. So, Things gradually built up, 1887. This was built by Sidney Waterloo and that James, chap James Hartnell, I said you wouldn't have heard of. Again, this is Southwark. It's only, Southwark's great because it's all there, right? So this is why I concentrated this bit. This is um, Waterloo and these are James Hartnell buildings, right? Now, they're working class dwellings. Note some cl little clever thing. The, the bottom, the ground floor is sunk. All right? Wonder why that is. Because the rules say if you build a building there, on that side of the road, that high, and there's a building there, you've got to have light at 45 degrees. So if you can't do it, You've either got to move it back or you've got to drop it down. And in this case, he dropped it down. You could only drop it half a story. That was the rules. These here are much more normal. That used to be Southwark Council's offices, housing offices there. 
Um, it, it was owned by Southwark. It's, it's Southwark Council owns the freehold of these. Now, those aren't bad, are they? You know, and again, we're talking working class housing. Right. Now we're going to get into the London County Council before we move on to the really interesting stuff. They actually have people coming abroad, Southwark Council, to look at these buildings. Now, don't get too excited. But <laughs> right. Now, this is from about the turn of the century, black and white photo. Three storeys, doesn't have to be five, five's the maximum. One there, one opposite, and there's another pair down another road. Okay, and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, they're all right. Then you start looking at what they look like now. I can tell you now, if there's plants outside a block of flats, that's a well-managed block of flats. If all you can see is washing hanging out, don't go near it, right? This is a well-managed, in fact, all the tenants of the ground floor have disabled. So they, they Southwark County Council allocated these for disabled people. The railings are gone during World War II. They couldn't very well take those railings away, but they took the ground floor ones. Now, this is the right hand and the other bit, the buildings here. Look at this thing here. That's the entrance to a block of flats. You wouldn't get that now, would you? And those are glazed Pilkington bricks. Right? That's quality. And the London County Council kept doing that. They understood the idea of this has to look good in 60 years. I'm not going to go in, you'll be pleased to know, I'm not going to go in the finances of any of this tonight. But all of this was built for a 60 year life after which you had to, they, they really did need renovation, as most of them have. Now, that's impressive. The other thing, a little thing to note, we're going to come to this, Clandon buildings. The London County Council were brilliant at their naming. No Nelson Mandela house, no gasworks buildings or anything, and we'll, we'll come to an estate in a moment, and you'll just love the names they gave these places. Right, do you remember I, we saw that booth map and that pink bit? This is the old nickel slum, the biggest slum, the worst slum in London. So Liverpool, here's the line to Liverpool Street, just here. That's the old Shoreditch station. And this is what the London County Council purchased. Don't forget, they've got to buy the land, they can't just nick it, somebody owns it. In fact, the ecclesiastical commissioners own most of this and uh, the Prince of Wales and people like that. That's the land. So they had to purchase the freehold and they had to purchase the, the buildings. The people living in it, they're only tenants, right? So you've got to be a bit careful because they've, they've got to get out. So what they did is they took this old nickel slum and they completely flattened it. And what they built in its place is the Boundary Street Estate, which has been on television a number of times. And what you see is wonderful. You've got a central garden with a bandstand on it and roads radiating out. And you think, wow, isn't that great? I've got to tell you, I've seen the minutes. They couldn't fit the number of buildings in any other way. Because they were building a very similar estate behind the Tate, where well, now the Tate and that one's just in ordinary. They were able to build that ordinary. But the building names, Hedsa, Laylam, uh, read these, they're Cookham, they're all places up the Thames. So there you are, you've, you're working class, you've just moved into this block and you live in Laylam House. Taplow, well they're built, they're always called buildings, Taplow buildings. Right, it's Molsey's there. Lovely. I'd love to have been at the meetings where they decided how, what they were going to name some of these. They really are magnificent names, some of them. Now, this is what they built. I am actually standing on the bandstand because it's, as you'll see in a minute, it's, it's raised up. And they built these buildings going round. I went there about October. Uh, and they look, still look like that. They go through little 10-year 
get a bit rough and they get a bit ready and they get rebuilt. And what is even better is this is the main road leading and that is the bandstand. And you think, so isn't that brilliant? But then if you're the architect and you've just demolished a slum, what are you going to do with all the stuff? You're going to pile it up in the middle and call it a garden and put a bandstand on it. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? It's, it they've got no, none of this um, cross-rail business of trains going out to Acton and all the way round to Essex. No. So they plonked it all in, they dug all the foundations, plonked it up and they called it a garden. It is a garden, it's lovely. They have concerts on the bandstand in the evenings. This road here leading from the, the main road, Shoreditch Road, He's now got a lot of artisan shops, artisan bakeries and things like that. Gentrification is coming. But very, very, the people love it there. There are three junior schools for the estate, three. All right. Right, but of course, what the London County Council would dream of, they always dreamed of, with the garden estates. This is, was their aim to create garden estates. They wanted everybody to have a garden. Great, I love it. Now, I've jumped right ahead because it's worth doing. This is actually from 1937. Right, so we come back here so shortly. All the red dots are the blocks up to five stories high. As you can see, rather dominated on the other side of London for obvious reasons. These orange bits are the garden estates. That's the Beckham Tree estate out in Essex. In my opinion, too big. It wasn't a particular success. Until the Ford factory got built there, there was a problem with employment. I'm going to, here, you're here. I'm going to talk about these and that one. So I've, I'm going to talk about the garden estates, the closest to here. So as you can see, and this is London, by the way, this red line is London. So a number of their garden estates are actually not in London. Because the London County Council, didn't, it, it wasn't, no, no, you've got to live here. You've got to be a member of here. What mattered was, where can the people live? We want people... That, the problem bit there is that the railway line in the, between the two was quite poor. But if you're going to build an estate, and the first one I'm going to talk about was built there, that, the day that opened was the first day of the tram to Tooting. Right? Integrated transport, wow. Yeah, they got, it, they got the, the act together. So that's to loop here, because I want to show you, to put it into context of what we're now going to look at. Right. And I'd love to say, here's the land, but actually, Richmond got in first. Right. It was called the Richmond Experiment, and they built Manor Grove. And Manor Grove was built before the London County Council got there. Be proud, right? You got in first. And it was the first large, fairly large-scale council housing in the whole of London and Surrey. All right, so be proud. Right, 1892, the first ones were opened, as we'll see. Uh, the London County Council, the first estate was 1903. It's a good decade ahead. Oh, but... Okay, I'm not going to knock this. It's only for tenants, for people who lived in Richmond. Whereas the London County Council could afford to say, as long as you pay the rent, who cares? Oh, and the Alderman, it's worth that, and Alderman William Thompson was the big driver of it. And that's what they built. I'm sure you know the Manor Estate by, North, by the station, North Sheen Station. Absolutely very typical of that period. So it's not, it's nothing wrong with this. It's good stuff. Very terrace, though, as we'll see from some of the others. But you are first. This is 10 years before anybody else got in. One thing I will say, you can't see it, that, that cost, each dwelling cost £220 to build. Ouch! That is expensive. 
London County Council as a financial director would have had art failure over that. But Richmond are paying for it for Richmond's people. Your choice. So, well, the ratepayer's choice. I also thought I'd better put that one in. I actually know somebody who used to live in that. I'm not too sure what the architect was sniffing when they designed that, but it doesn't look right. I, it looks like the back of Osterley, Osterley House or the great staircase going up to it, but something went a bit wrong. I, I, my friend is not here tonight, otherwise I would have asked her what she thought of it because I know she used to live there. But that's also Alderman Thompson's. Right, Bill, he, he, he planned that. So be proud, Richmond, be proud. You got there first. Right, but come back to London County Council. If you want scale, you need London County Council. And London County Council built housing to house 8,788. If you're wondering how on earth you get a number as accurate as that, number of rooms times two. Full stop. Not a bedroom, right? Number of rooms times two. Sorry, num got it wrong. Number of bedrooms times two. And two, a person is nine years or over. It's that easy. So it's a very rough calculation. But what it did mean is you controlled overcrowding. That was quite important to the London County Council. Right, what they did is they purchased on the open market, a section of land near Tooting. So this is Tooting Broadway down, that's Tooting Beck and Tooting the Broadway down there. And the tram was planned to come down there. Is it St George's, the famous hospital in Tooting? St George's, isn't it? That's that. Or oh, rebuilt now. Okay, so they bought that and they built their first estate. And I bet that wasn't quite what you were expecting. Because when people think of garden estates, they think of gardens with houses built on it. No, houses with gardens. Right? But don't, get, don't, don't worry, because that's what it looks like. That is impressive, even to me now. Look at the styles they got there. This is very wide road, trees. Right, now being the London County Council, they try and get some good people to open it. In this photo are three future kings of England on the opening day. Right, the little sailors, the future George VI, the big sailors, the future Edward VIII, and one of these hats here is the future uh, George V, the Prince of Wales. So that's Princess Mary. He's, he look, this looks like the George V, but there's no way he's going to be back there with people in front of him. He's going to be in the head of that. So he's one of these hats here. And they're opening, they're visiting the house. If I go back a bit, you can see all the people hanging out here. This photo is in the Metropolitan Archives. I went to the house, knocked on the door, gave him a photo and increased the value of his house instantly by £10,000. <laughs> I said, give me, give me, you know. No. <laughs> he was actually really chuffed. He was quite interested. <laughs> right. Now, what I've... We've, the pro, those, there were four estates started, two finished before World War I. Along comes World War II. After, on, at the end of World War II, about a week after, um, the Prime Minister stood up and he said, I'm going to build what became Homes Fit for Heroes. It was just a finance scheme. So you had to build it as an authority, but they helped you with the money. The only people that could afford to do this housing early on were the big authorities. In, in fact, London and the West Midlands were the two big ones that built it. And the first one built in, in after the first, first World War in London was London County Council with the Dover House Estate. And this, where's the hospital? Roehampton Hospital, 
This is Roehampton High Street, right, Upper Richmond Road, the A3's here, so you know where you are. Many will know what's over here, the Alton Estate, with the tower blocks. That's over here. Now, what they did was built this. And what, that's what they ended up building. Now, the great thing about this, you can go all over the country and see estates looking like this because the housing was standardised. Right. So, a chap called Tudor Walters. You've got to love a bloke called Tudor Walters, haven't you? He had a wonderful moustache as well. He developed these. And if you said, right, we're going to have a type A, 500 type A's, type B's, type C's, really boring A, B, C, D, you were able to get the money quicker. If you de designed them architects yourself, you've then got to try and persuade the government to loan you the money on them. So this type of building here, absolutely typical all over the country. That's what it looks like today. The only difference is the trees have grown and the cars have appeared. <laughs> right? And you can see here the quality of them. But almost in comparison with the Manor Grove is they, don't forget, they also built, they didn't build grand. You've still got to build two bedroom houses. And these are the smallest ones, two ups, two downs. Rather nice. That is my son's house. All right? That's where my son lives. He loves it. He's looking on to allotments, which are in the middle. That's the other thing that London County Council did, was put allotments between the housing. Right. Keeping it to this bit of London. I don't know, hopefully some of you know where the Castle No Estate is. So what you got is Hammersmith Bridge up here. Still closed? Still closed, isn't it? Yeah. Right, now, the Castle No Estate is interesting. What happened after World War I is bricks and bricklayers were in short supply. So they decided to look at alternate construction methods and these are built of concrete. And it's, they call it the Henry, it's the, Hen, whoop, the Henry Boot Pier and Panel System. These, this, they actually built factories during World War I in this method, and they adapted it to housing. Right? Great idea until you see what happens. <laughs> right, so what you did, they poured, these were pour, built on site, poured concrete with the steel rods in. They then slotted them into the foundation and then the wall sections were slid in, then rendered. All right? The idea was you could do it, you didn't need bricklayers, you could do it with semi-skilled people. That's the problem when you build concrete houses and you don't look after them. This is actually northeast England, this is near Middlesbrough. They've all been demolished, as you can well imagine. And this is what happens with the piers. These are breeze blocks that have been inserted because the, the panels have already broken up. All right? Now, as you can probably gather, they've, got, they've been knocked down. But this is a house from Castle Low. You can actually see the panels all right. Now, the problem with houses on Castle Nose, you can't get a mortgage on them because of the construction. So what you have to do is you have to get a specialist in who injects fluids all over it to neutralise all the acids, and, they, and then you brick veneer it. You put brick on the outside. And this is what's happened here. So this house, this little L-shaped house, is that one. That door there is that door there. That's original, but these have had brick veneer on. Now you can get a mortgage. Now you can sell it because somebody, somebody can get a mortgage. This, interestingly, this building here was built of brick from the word go because it's the wrong shape for the bit. You can't do fancy shapes, angles, 
boot, boot, boot pier and uh, panel has to be right angles. So that one is actually brick from the word go. So that's Castle Now. A great idea that didn't work. It's the only estate London County Council built using that particular method. Right. But the height of London County Council came when they built St. Helier and Sutton. So Sutton is down here. That's Morden Station. That's the Wandle Valley. Still industrialised. When we get to St. Helier, this is a large estate. And it's all brick. Forget, right? You'll love that. They built houses of steel plate, right? There's two estates in London that still have houses of, with the walls that are still plate. There are concrete, dry concrete blocks rendered. In the end, they went, let's just go back to brick. <laughs> and it worked. So they built the estate. Now, the, look at these houses. These aren't much different than that Dover house. So it's the standard pattern of the 1920s. Gra this is London County Council. Look at it. Grass there. That's there to the grass. Wide roads, fortunately, because the cars are there now. No garages, of course. My I had auntie and uncle, married in 1938, moved into a two-bedroom house there. Their son, my cousin, moved my auntie out of there, aged 95, to St. Helier Hospital, where she died a week later. She lived there all her life. You could eat your dinner off the doorstep. Right? Because it was her house. No, it wasn't. Yes, no, it wasn't. Like, yes, it was. It was my... She loved her little house. And that was quite important, that pride. And my cousin said, across the road, there was a field, there was a park. Wow. I grew up, actually, with a park opposite. Very handy thing to have when you kick a football. Right, so, what happened with the London County Council taking things through between the wars was the legacy they left behind. And this kick-started the 1930s housing development. The second house I grew up in on the Council of Whitton Boulders, perfectly nice 1930s semi with leaded lights around the top and everything. Absolutely lovely house. It all started from this ground surge of building, particularly the estates. Quality housing. Every, the houses built between the wars are almost all quality. Rising standards and, of course, expectations. Your expect you work in class, but you have an expectation of a nice house. Baseline for funding. Now, up until the 30s, you couldn't pay for the houses on the rates. You had to borrow the money, right? But from the 1930s, laws came in that allowed you to fund the housing from the rates, which was, what, of course, what's happened now. But that was quite novel in those days. And, of course, they built garden estates. Don't forget, London County Council was still building blocks where they were needed, but their big thing was garden estates. And some very good acts of parliament came in to help them build. So funding from the rates. And that's important, council housing, positive. Those who grew up there, or your, grand, or your parents did, or whatever, they weren't ashamed of living in council houses. It was a house, it was nice. My auntie, it was her house. No, no it wasn't, yes it is, it's my house. But, to leave you with a warning, it isn't all wonderful, there's they can, they can get things badly wrong nowadays, not then. Right, a very, very harsh word. This is Poplar. This is the, the river, goes down there, all the way round. So the, I'm standing in the Isle of Dogs, okay? This is now Docklands. And there was a block of flats there and some little houses which are still there. And what the people's the London Borough of Tower Hamlets wanted to do was get rid of all these 
buildings from the London County Council and collect everybody and put you in one estate, which of course is absolutely fine if you get it right. So, that was what they knocked down. Now you look at it and you say, okay, they're not great, are they? Right? You're not going to win any awards with those. However, they've got balconies. You look down into a yard, into where the kids are playing. There's a lot of good things about that. They aren't actually flat roof. They look flat roof, they're not. They've got pitch roof on them. And it was known as the Canada Estate because there's Ottawa buildings, Baffin buildings. It's great. They name things wonderfully. And the reason is it's next to Canada Dock. <laughs> so they named it after uh, places in uh, areas of Canada. Right, so they knocked that down and some others in the area. And they replaced it with that, which is famous. This is the Robin Hood Gardens Estate in Poplar. Right? Would you believe there are three of those blocks? There's not one of them, there's three. Was. One here, one here, and there would be one behind me. There was when I took the photo, it's not there now. Right? So they built that. And it was built by the, uh, Alison and Peter Simpson. It was the only block of housing they ever built. I wonder why that was, right? Architecturally, it was a disaster. They made every single mistake you could. Can you, you can see there's balconies, okay? Can you just see there's little doors? Those are the fire escapes. So you can't put anything on your little balcony because it's the fire escape. So you, none of this, I'll put your bikes there or stuff. Well, obviously people did, but the housing managers had to get people clearing it. You could not get off any of these without going down stairs or lifts. The equivalent building to this is in Sheffield. I can't remember the names of escape now, but the biggest state in Sheffield. You could... Park, Park Hill, Park Hill, which was actually brilliantly designed. Not very well managed was its problem. This one, the lifts were broken within a year. Right? They landscaped, this is these architects, you can hate these people after a while, they landscaped the land in the middle so kids could not play football. Right? You can even see now, look, it's hills and everything. So what they did in the end, it's just off here, they built a big baseball, a baseball, basketball court, which of course became the drug dealing centre for the area. <laughs> now, that still exists. The others are gone, but the only reason they're existing, it's got squatters in, and they've got to try and get rid of the squatters first. Right? If you think that's bad, this is the nice side of the building. <laughs> that's the outside. People, this block, these three blocks are surrounded by dual carriageways. The only way in and out when they built them was underpasses. And you know that's a disaster, don't you? When you, you've got your mum in the wheelchair and she's got to go down a concrete underpass to get the shops. It's not going to work. Didn't. Right. Some idiot actually wanted a grade one listed, but I think they murdered him, so he got rid of him. <laughs> right, you can still see it now, uh, because there, they, as I say, it's an awful condition. I was there very recently, my, my mate and I walked there very recently, it's awful. Right. What they're building now are probably the replacement slums, <laughs> but they're building very nondescript blocks going round. And of course, everybody's going, well, they're going to be like this in 20 years' time. Not for me to say. So that's a warning. You can get it right and you can get it badly wrong. The main thing is you need to manage it very carefully, which is the problem we have at the moment. We need another, uh, what's her name? The lady, my brain's failed me. Octavia, I had to live here in there. Octavia, we need another one of her there. Anyway, so I've overrun a little bit. So I hope you found it enjoyable, right? And thank you for your time.
That's, that's really marvellous, uh, Martin. I had uh, no idea about the sort of long-distance history of, of council housing. Yes, it goes back a long way, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, I'm gonna use, before we go, because I'll use my chairman's prerogative to ask the first question, which is really around, you were talking about Southwark. Yes. And it seems to be that a lot of, of Southwark housing is still in the ownership of the... So it wasn't sold off and hasn't necessarily been gentrified. <laughs> The buildings haven't been sold off, but the right, uh, right to buy. So people have bought their flats as they are now, but they, the freehold of all Southwark buildings are still owned by Southwark Council, ah. right? And it's interesting, there's a block, right near Waterloo Station, there's a block of five buildings. And I went in there as part of my research and chatted to a guy and he, got a, he was going to get a bill, which everybody was getting a bill for £16,000 for their contribution for the roof. Right? And which he's going like this. And there's a guy in a wheelchair, who's a council telling him, going, <laughs> not my problem. So yeah. do you, but does that prevent then people from investing in their own houses if they don't own the, the free? No, house? to be fair. If you've bought, you can still sell it on, don't forget. It's right. just that timing, the bad luck that they had to have a roof. The blocks had to be re, re well, they were slated, new slates on the roof. And, it, and of course, everybody had to pay their share, whether you were on the fifth floor or the ground floor. Yes. Right. But um, Islington have sold theirs, the People's Republic of Islington, they don't like council housing. Um, Wandsworth. They got the Orton estate and not much else now. My, my son owns the freehold of this Dover House estate. So they, they, they pulled the free, so they have the freehold right, of right, that. Right, it's not yeah. leasehold. Right, right. Yeah. Right, can we, uh, who's, who would like to ask the first question? There's a roving mic. I can't see where it is at the moment. Ah, Mark's got it. So um, if you can wait to, for the roving mic and then uh, ask a question. Hello. Oh, well, oh, that's it. Minute. <laughs> Crikey. Um, thank you so much. That was genuinely very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, you, you mentioned that count the, you know, the term council housing um, was seen as a positive thing. When do you think it switched over into being a negative thing and why? Right. I can almost give you a year. It's not quite, but it's almost. It's about 1962. And what happened is they, all the councillors started finding this older housing was getting very expensive because it needed renovation. And along come the building of, block, of uh, towers. Remember Ronan Point? Right? So uh, you, 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 the way they built the, the quality. So they, what they did is said, great, we can build these huge tower blocks and bung people in. Then it all went wrong. Now there are some. There is. There are two tall tower blocks in Poplar who, that are built of concrete, but they poured it. So it's poured. It's, it, they don't do that nowadays. But they poured it. People are queuing to buy those places, flats, because they're fabulous condition. But they're 1958, right? So you've got this period. It all started to go wrong. Construction methods and money. 1960s. I will state now that I think Maggie Thatcher's right to buy was correct because there was so much housing in very bad condition. It solved a lot of problems. The mistake was she forced the councillors to use the money to pay their debts, not to build more housing. And that's the mistake, right? So, Early 60s, it started going wrong. Social deprivation, kids running wild, teddy boys. Who remembers teddy boys? Teddy boys. Never won myself. <laughs> yeah, early 60s. And it was a social move as well. It wasn't just the quality. People were... My dad bought his house, well, sorry, mortgaged, 1951. Banker dad. His dad lent him the money. 1951. So, you know, that's, that's when it really changed. It wasn't sudden, but it was over about five years. It was quite a big difference. Got another Good question. question. <laughs> yes, the lady, lady there. Uh, Just, uh, third row, fourth row. 
Thank you. Yes, thank you for a very interesting talk. I um, just want to say first, I'm not ashamed to have lived in two council houses as a child. <laughs> and uh, more, um, more, of, more of a general point, I think up and certainly, you probably know the dates better than me, but at least up until the end of the 50s, they were very well built. And the, although the ones you showed us in pictures were very attractive looking, um, later on they were perhaps, you know, rather boring looking, but very practical. Yeah. Because, you know, they'd have, they'd have the place to put your rubbish, your cupboard at the front, yeah. and all those things you actually need. Whereas when private houses are built, sm smaller, less expensive ones, yeah. you know, they skimp on that, skimp that, on things. That is absolutely true. Now, we, if any of you know Woken, there's a bit of Woken called Shearwater. And there's the Shearwater Estate, and it was built in the early 50s by the London County Council. Very boring looking houses, but people loved them. And they're knocking a lot of them down to build, to replace them with a more modern housing, which of course is much better for heat and everything. And Stevenage Newtown, built in the 50s. Welling, London County Council. And it's the same, it is. You know, it's not just yes, I've got a nice kitchen or anything. It, there was a very, very, very practical side to it. Yeah. Um, we're starting to run out of time, I think. So uh, Martin's very kindly said that he'll stay for a bit longer um, downstairs where we're having some drinks. <laughs> so you're very welcome, all of you, to come and uh, you know have drinks and yeah, further... You, for, you forced me to stay. For, yeah, <laughs> further discussion um, uh, now. Um, this, of course, is the last of our talks before the summer recess. We're re regathering in September, so look forward to seeing as many of you there then. Thanks very much. Thank you. Ooh. One thing, sorry. The most important thing, as a token of our appreciation, oh, thank you very much, Ross. That's, that's thank great. You. Thanks, Thanks very much. much.